Wow, we have lots of participants. That's exciting. 53 folks so far. That's, that's awesome. Okay, um, let's, give, let's give it a minute before we start. And Jack, um, uh, let's see, let's just keep admitting folks. Awesome. All right, lots of folks coming in. Okay, I will try to keep admitting people as I as I talk here. Sounds good. All right, all. Well, it gives me uh, enormous pleasure, actually bittersweet pleasure, to uh, introduce Jack Koch today for his PhD uh, thesis defense oral exam, the public part of his exam. Um, I'm just admitting a few more people here. Uh, Jack had arrived um, interested in, Jack, what year did you start? 2015. 2015. He arrived uh, very interested in studying the temperate anemone that's off our coast here, Anthopleura elegantissima, after having spent a summer at Friday Harbor from the East Coast, so he, he wasn't a native to the West Coast, but was very intrigued by Anthopleura um, because of um, some really interesting qualities about its symbiosis that he'll tell you about. Um, at the time, we were exploring a collaboration with a group of us at OSU that didn't really end up flying for a variety of, of reasons. Um, and the, the consequence of that for Jack really was that he ended up funding most of his work on his own. Um, he, he obtained an NSF GRFP. He got um, innumerable little mini grants to uh, fund his research uh, in various ways, including quite a bit of thesis or quite a bit of uh, field research. And uh, one of the traits that uh, was amazing about him is that he established collaboration successfully really on his own. I mean, there were, there were times when I would introduce him to folks, but by and large, um, these were collaborations that he uh, initiated and launched. And one of the amazing things about Jack is that he, uh, he, he approaches interactions with people from like deans down to undergraduates, you know, that's that span of, of, of experience and age, really with the same open professional and respectful grace. It, it's, it's an incredible quality that Jack has. Um, he, is, he also has the wonderful quality of enhancing a group dynamic. Uh, in the Weiss lab, his presence seemed to make everyone be their best selves. And that's an incredible uh, a gift uh, to an advisor uh, to watch that group dynamic and the way Jack's uh, personality really formulated and drove people to be really their best selves. I can't emphasize that enough. He's headed uh, to a postdoc now in Terry Tiersch's lab at LSU. Terry is here. This is one of the beauty, one of the very few silver linings of Zoom is that there are uh, 74 people here and they're from all places in his life, um, including his future uh, professional spot. Uh, in Terry Tiersch's lab at LSU. And he will be um, helping Terry, uh, Terry's group develop a plesia, which is the sea hair, uh, that is such an incredibly powerful model system for neurobiology. Uh, developing that model system, um, the cryopreservation techniques and repositories for a plesia to make it broadly available to a broad um, NIH sort of level community. Jack is a master tinkerer. He's a problem solver. Uh, he'll use these skills a lot in his, um, in his new position with Terry because this is sort of uncharted territory. He's moving into a completely different area. Um, 
I am incredibly proud of him. And I, again, it's so bittersweet for me to, um, to be sending him off on his way. I wanted to share um, just two slides uh, of, of, of Jack that really encapsulate some of the, the features of his um, personality. The first one is uh, a, a trip that we took in the San Juan Islands in uh, 2017 when Jack was performing a big part of his thesis work with Dr. Alan Verdi, who is a, a former postdoc of mine, and they collaborated together on studies, a big study that he'll talk to you about today. And uh, these are all, this is Shimpei and Trevor and John. And it was like such a dude moment. Of course, I took the photo, so I was in there too, but it was just a wonderful moment. We had a, we had a great time together touring about the islands. And then this second photo really sums Jack up. This is a photo that Jack took with a, um, you know, a, a delayed uh, timer on his camera function. He's a great photographer. And just the, this is Jack and John and Trevor um, leaping with joy and capturing it in the moment at the top of Mary's Peak. And that is what Jack is like as a person um, and uh, what he has done for the lab. So I am, like I said, I'm, I'm very, very excited for him in his new um, spot, but it will be a huge loss for the Weiss Lab. Um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, introduce his defense the title is Influence of the Environment and Morphology on Physiological and Genomic Homeostasis in a Temperate Cnidarian Microbe Symbiosis. And I'm going to stop my screen share and let Jack take over. Wow, thank you for that introduction, Virginia. Um, I, I should have asked you to go last so that I wouldn't almost break out in tears. And thank you all for joining us here virtually today to hear about some of the projects that I've been working on over the past five and a half years. Come on, PowerPoint, work with me. We're gonna start off in space. We're about 8,500 kilometers or for you Americans, 5,300 miles above Earth's surface. We're gonna travel to the intertidal ecosystem on the west coast of North America Specifically, we're going to Oregon to a site called Boiler Bay. And Boiler Bay is named for the large ship boiler that lies in the bottom of the bay. At low tide, if you travel down to Boiler Bay, this is what you might see. There are many rocks covered in fleshy macroalgae. And if you look under this fleshy macroalgae, you might find a crab skittering by, a sea urchin munching, maybe a fish or two, and if you're very lucky, you might find an octopus. The intertidal ecosystem is necessary to study for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it provides habitat and nursery space for a wide diversity of organisms. It assists in nutrient cycling and disturbance regulation. One of the prominent members of intertidal ecosystems on the West Coast are sea anemones. And this is what many sea anemones look like at low tide. You may mistake them for pebbles, but in fact, there are over 50 sea anemones in this picture. If you add a little bit of water, sea anemones bloom into these beautiful organisms. This is the temperate intertidal sea anemone Anthopleura elegantissima, also known by its common name, the aggregating sea anemone. And one of the interesting features of this sea anemone is that it comes in three flavors, chocolate, pistachio, and vanilla. Though I guess if you don't like pistachio, we could call it mint. Please don't eat these sea anemones though. For this presentation, I'll be referring to these different colors as brown, green, and white anemones. And these colors are conferred by the presence or absence of different microalgal symbionts. Microalgae are like tiny plants that in this case are living within the sea anemone tissue. Brown anemones engage in symbiosis with the dinoflagellate, Breviola muscatinii, which is in the same family of dinoflagellates that also joins in symbiosis with corals in tropical ecosystems. Green anemones join in symbiosis with a green algae, a chlorophyte, a elliptochlorus morena, whose closest relatives are typically found in aerial, terrestrial, and sometimes freshwater ecosystems. And then white anemones have very few or no algal symbionts present, 
So the colors you're seeing that white anemone are strictly from the host. Now, in addition to these microalgal symbionts, sea anemones have a host of microbes known as the microbiome. This includes bacteria, archaea, viruses, and fungi. And these can be beneficial or detrimental to the host. Now, you'll recall that the anemone's common name is the aggregating anemone, and they exist in clonal aggregates. So all of the anemones in this blue box here are of a single clone. Just like this colony to the left, all a single clone, same with this colony to the right. And these clonal colonies are organized in such a way that the smaller anemones are towards the outside and the larger anemones are in the middle. These small anemones protect, protect the colony from neighboring colonies, and I'll just call them soldiers here. The anemones in the center are responsible for re reproduction and the colonies will fight with each other to maintain space in the intertidal ecosystem. We're gonna to travel to space one more time. And now I've drawn a line between Alaska and Baja, California, Mexico. This is about 4,000 kilometers or 2,500 miles. And this represents the geographic distribution of Anthopleura elegantissima. Those different colors of an enemy that I talked about before, they are distributed as such. Green anemones are found in higher latitudes, brown anemones in lower latitudes, and white anemones are found throughout the geographic range in caves or under rocks or buried in the sand. Brown and green distribution is driven by light and temperature. So green anemones are found in cooler, low light environments, and brown anemones are found in warmer, high light environments. Now this intertidal ecosystem that they live in is naturally dynamic. So organisms living there have to deal with wave action, competition between and within organisms. At low tide, they have to deal with desiccation or the lack of water, as well as the heat of the midday sun. And then when the tide comes back in, this cold water is splashing on them. So these organisms have to deal with a, a cold shock. In addition, there are many oceanographic conditions that can change the intertidal environment. These might be changes in salinity, temperature, nutrients, pH. And one major phenomenon that happens on continental boundaries is called upwelling. On Western continental boundaries, upwelling happens when wind blows from the north to south parallel to the shoreline. And in conjunction with the Earth's rotation, this drives warmer water offshore and allows deeper water to upwell into these nearshore environments. This deeper water is typically colder, hypoxic or low in oxygen, has low pH and is nutrient rich. These nutrients drive productivity in this nearshore environment. Hypoxia can have negative effects for organisms that rely on oxygen such as fishes and low pH has mixed effects on organisms living in this nearshore environment. With all of these dynamics, animals and plants need mechanisms to help maintain balance. We call these homeostatic mechanisms. And some examples of homeostatic mechanisms include enzymes, such as carbonic anhydrases, which we'll learn a little bit about today, and soluble adenylene cyclases, another type of enzyme, as well as their microbes that live on and within them. So the microalgae living in these sea anemones can provide some homeostatic mechanisms for the anemones. And then that microbiome, those bacteria, archaea, fungi, fungi and viruses um, can potentially provide some amelioration for these changes. These make symbiotic sea anemones a model for studying some aspects of coral symbiosis as well as the effects of climate change on the symbiotic interaction and host health. My dissertation had three major projects. The first was attempting to sequence and assemble the green algal symbiont genome, so Elliptochloris morena. The second was looking at the carbonic anhydrase enzymes and how they change with symbiosis, light intensi intensity, and body size. And the third was looking at how reduced seawater pH and symbiosis affect gastrovascular cavity uh, microbiome function. I don't have time to talk about the first project today, but I was not successful in sequencing and assembling the genome here. We'll start by looking at carbonic anhydrase enzymes in the sea anemone. 
This is a cross section of a sea anemone and sea anemones are made up of two tissue layers, the epidermis, which is an outer tissue layer. It's in contact with the environment and the gastrodermis, which is this tan layer here that lines the gastrovascular cavity. You might think of the gastro gastrovascular cavity as a stomach, though sea anemones don't have stomachs, but this is where digestion takes place. The gastrodermal layer is also where these algal symbionts live. So you can see in this tentacle over here, these algal symbionts that are living within gastrodermal cells. These algal symbionts are undergoing photosynthesis. So they're taking carbon dioxide and water in the presence of solar energy and creating sugar and oxygen. And they pass some of the sugar to the host. But they really need the CO2 and being deeply embedded within host tissue presents a physiological problem for the host to move CO2 to these algal symbionts. And they could do this in a variety of ways. Now we're gonna look at, if we took a cross section of this tentacle here, so we have the external environment seawater, that first outer layer of tissue, the epiderm, the inner tissue layer, the gastroderm, and here you can see some algal symbionts, and then that gastrovascular cavity. And then the same for the other side. One way that the host could pass CO2 to their symbionts is through cellular respiration. All cells undergo cellular respiration and one of the products of cellular respiration is CO2. So why not just recycle that CO2 and make it into sugar? Sea anemones could also diffuse or transport CO2 or bicarbonate from the seawater through two tissue layers to their algal symbionts or they could diffuse or transport these two products from the gastrovascular cavity through one tissue layer to their symbionts. Though research suggests that all of these processes are too slow to support the high rates of photosynthesis that we observe in many of these algal symbionts. So organisms rely on enzymes to help speed up reactions. This is carbonic anhydrase, and I'll abbreviate as CA throughout the talk. And carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the interconversion of this reaction. So it can take carbon dioxide and water and convert it into a hydrogen ion and bicarbonate or the other way around. So it can take bicarbonate and hydrogen ion and produce water and CO2. I'll point out this hydrogen ion here. The use or creation of this hydrogen ion also allows carbonic anhydrase to play a role in pH homeostasis. So in humans, carbonic anhydrases help maintain blood pH. In symbiotic sea anemones, it has a dual role. So helping maintain pH homeostasis as well as providing CO2 to algal symbionts. We might imagine a model where these carbonic anhydrases are strategically placed either outside of cells, within cell membranes, or within cells in such a way that we drive CO2 to the site of photosynthesis faster than it would happen unaided. We measure carbonic anhydrase using an activity assay. So for this project, I froze the anemones in liquid nitrogen in the field. I homogenized the animal tissue and spun out the algae. Algae also have carbonic anhydrases, but we are only interested in the animal carbonic anhydrases here. And then I measured the ability of that homogenate to change pH. So you'll recall that this is the reaction that's carbonic anhydrase uh, catalyzes. And if we add CO2 saturated DI water, we drive the reaction to the right and create a bunch of hydrogen ions. And this increase in hydrogen ions results in a negative change in pH. So the, uh, the units for CA activity is the negative change in pH per minute per milligram of animal soluble protein. All right, so we're measuring that change over time. And then we're indexing that CA activity measurement to animal protein to account for different sizes of uh, different sizes of a piece of an enemy that we put into this assay. So I was interested in answering three questions. First, how does CA activity differ between different symbiotic states, between different sizes, and then how does CA gene expression differ, differ between different symbiotic states? As a reminder, we have these three symbiotic states, and these brown and green anemones have algal symbionts that are undergoing photosynthesis. And we know that there are differences in algal productivity between these brown and green symbionts. 
work done by Verdi and Miklowski in 1996 showed that the brown algal symbiont, so Breviolum, was more productive than the, the, the green algal symbiont, Elliptochlorus. So we might expect that these brown algae need more CO2 compared to the green algae. And we can apply this to a carbonic anhydrase activity prediction. We might predict that brown anemones have the highest sea activity because their symbionts need the most CO2. Green anemones have moderate sea activity because their symbionts need less CO2. And white anemones need low sea activity just to maintain pH homeostasis. So we'll first look at how activity changes with symbiotic state, and then we'll look at how gene expression changes with symbiotic state. The x-axis of this graph are their three symbiotic states, brown, green, and white. And I have a sample size of 10 for each of these symbiotic states. The y-axis is the CA activity. So the higher the CA activity, the more carbonic anhydrase we have. And then I've also put the prediction up here as a reminder. So first we'll compare brown to white. And as you can see, there's a significantly increase, a significantly higher carbonic anhydrase activity in brown anemones compared to white anemones. And this is not surprising. This has been shown in other sea anemones, as well as in Mantiplar elegantissima in this Weiss and Reynolds 199 paper. What is surprising is where the greens fall out. You'll see that greens are significantly lower in carbonic anhydrase activity compared to browns, but there's no difference between green and white. So what could be going on here? It's possible that those green algae are able to rely solely on cellular respiration for their CO2 needs, and they don't induce CA, uh, induce the host to express carbonic anhydrases. We also have to look at the Rubisco enzymes, which are responsible for uh, catalyzing the fixation of CO2 in the photosynthesis reaction. Green algae Rubisco are, have a higher affinity for CO2 so we might think of them as being more efficient. So they can capture more CO2 with less around compared to those dinoflagellates. In summary here, I showed that brown anemones have high sea activity and green and whites have low sea activity. So now we're gonna look at how gene expression differs between symbiotic states. So to measure gene expression, I identified potential carbonic anhydrases from the transcriptome. I use phylogenetics to predict subcellular localization. And this is the tree that I appended my sequences to. Most of the information in this tree originated from this Legoff et al. 2016 paper. And what I did was download their protein sequences, insert my Antiplur elegantissima protein sequences, realign everything, and then produce a new tree. The pink genes here are predicted to be secreted. The blue genes are predicted to be cytosolic or mitochondrial, and the green genes are predicted to be secreted or membrane bound. I picked carbonic anhydrase genes that localize to different locations, and then using the same anemones as in that previous experiment, I extracted RNA and synthesized complementary DNA, and then ran qPCR in the samples and analyzed those with MCMC qPCR in R. I had four carbonic anhydrase genes that I looked at, and so there'll be four little subgraphs here. The y-axis of this is the relative log two expression fold change compared to aposymbiotic anemones. So all of my data was normalized to two housekeeping genes, and then I set aposymbiotic anemone gene expression to zero so that I could measure differences in the brown and green groups. I did pairwise tests between the groups using a t-test, and then the um, error bars you'll see are 95% credible intervals. And then I've put the carbonic anhydrase activity results down here as a reminder. So this first carbonic anhydrase is predicted to be cytosolic. And I found no difference in the expression between different symbiotic states. And this is surprising because Weiss and Reynolds also identified this carbonic anhydrase. And in their hands, they measured an increase in gene expression in brown anemones compared to whites. The second carbonic anhydrase is membrane bound, uh, putatively membrane bound. And I found that browns had significantly higher fold change compared to greens, 
but that there is no difference between white and brown and white and green. The third carbonic anhydrase was predicted to be secreted. And I found that brown anemones had increased, significantly increased fold change compared to whites, but there, there was no difference between brown and green and green and white. And then finally, for this predicted secreted or membrane-bound carbonic anhydrase, I found this uh, very strongly down-regulated um, CA in green, uh, sorry, in browns, significantly upregulated in greens, all compared to each other. So this would suggest that the green anemones were potentially using this carbonic anhydrase to pass CO2 to their algal symbionts. Brown anemones could be using the center two carbonic anhydrases. And then that this first carbonic anhydrase maybe plays a role or a bigger role in pH homeostasis. So how does CA gene expression differ between elegantissima and different symbiotic states? And the answer is it depends on what gene you're looking at. Finally, for this project, we'll look at how CA activity differs with some uh, different sizes. And a little primer on does size matter. Let's imagine that we have these different sized cubes. So we have a three by three cube, so that's a big cube, two by two cube, and a one by one cube. And the relationship that I want to point out here is the surface area to volume ratio. These large animals, or in this case, large cube, have a lower surface area to volume ratio compared to these small cubes or smaller animals, right? So the surface area to volume ratio of six for the small and two for the large. And with this, we might expect this increased surface area relative to your volume. You have more surface area for CO2 to, 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 to diffuse through, and you might need less carbonic anhydrase to drive CO2 to your algal symbionts. And this hypothesis was, um, was observed in this Weiss et al. 1989 paper. They looked at both corals and sea anemones and found that corals and sea anemones with a high surface area to volume ratio, so smaller, have low CA activity. And corals and sea anemones with a low surface area to volume ratio, like that bigger cube, had high CA activity. So we might apply this trend to a prediction for this study. And we might predict that small brown animals will have low CA activity and large brown animals will have high CA activity. The x-axis of this chart is column crown diameter, which is my proxy for anemone size, and y-axis is CA activity. And then again, I've put the prediction up here as a reminder. And we found exactly opposite of what we predicted. Small anemones have very high CA activity and large anemones have very low CA activity. So what are some potential explanations here? Let's revisit anemone aggregate organization. So you'll recall that these smaller anemones near the outside of the colony and these larger anemones near the inside of the colony. And from a bird's eye view, we can't measure volume of these sea anemones because we're looking at a two-dimensional picture, but we can measure the surface area of these tentacles and this oral disc. And these smaller anemones have a smaller surface area for prey capture, and these larger anemones have a larger surface area for prey capture. So we might predict that the smaller anemones are relying more heavily on photoautotrophic nutrition or getting sugar from their algal symbionts, and that the larger anemones are relying more heavily on heterotrophic nutrition or capturing food from the water column. So if they're getting more uh, nutrition from heterotrophy, then maybe they don't, they don't need as much sugar from their algal symbionts, so they don't need to upregulate carbonic anhydrase as much. So how does CA activity differ between symbiotic sizes or different sizes? Um, there's a negative relationship between size and CA activity. Some future work to explore more carbonic anhydrase things in Anthopleur elegantissima. We could explore techniques that allow us to measure carbonic anhydrase activity of specific CAs. So our activity assay kind of measured the global carbonic anhydrase activity, not specific ones like our gene expression did. We could test the size nutrition hypothesis using a lab feed starve experiment and using stable isotope analysis or nanosims. 
and then more precise measurements of surface area to volume ratio with micro CT, MRI, or NMR. And we have a little bit of pilot work on this done that was performed by um, Allison Tepp, an undergraduate who performed her uh, honors thesis under my mentorship. She scanned um, a sea anemone using micro CT, and this is what, what it looks like. Again, very preliminary, but hopeful. So now we'll shift gears to look at how reduced seawater pH and symbiosis affect the gastrovascular cavity microbiome function. And I'll abbreviate gastrovascular cavity as GVC here. So you'll recall that the intertidal is a naturally dynamic ecosystem. In addition to these natural dynamics, there are a host of anthropogenic or human driven dynamics that have emerged over the last uh, half century. These include nitrogen runoff from agricultural input, changes in land use affect how waves interact with the shorelines, and then burning of fossil fuels contribute to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we're gonna focus on that. One of these greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that dissolves into our oceans causes ocean acidification or OA. So the CO2 dissolves into the seawater and interacts with water and through a series of transformations creates carbonate ions and hydrogen ions. And this increase in hydrogen ions is what causes the decrease in pH or acidification of our oceans. Now, ocean acidifications are not negative in all ecosystems. They have mixed effects. Uh, this is a figure from Donnie et al. 2020. And for example, in seagrass meadows, ocean acidification um, increases primary productivity, which is a positive, but incre also increases grazing by herbivores, which is a negative if you're a seagrass. On coral reefs, in general, ocean, ocean acidification is a negative. But some organisms, such as symbiotic sea anemones, has been identified as winners under ocean acidification conditions. And these winners have homeostatic mechanisms that are working. Um, right? We just learned about carbonic anhydrases and their ability to maintain pH homeostasis. Now we're going to look at the microbiome and how that might help with pH homeostasis. We all have microbiomes. The Human Microbiome Project showed us that um, humans have many different microbiomes based on where you sample. So your respiratory system has a microbiome that is different than your skin, that is different than your digestive tract, that is different than your urogenital tract. And these microbiomes are generally good for us, right? Microbes in your digestive system help to um, extract nutrients and break down food. Though if this microbiome gets out of whack, it can lead to cancer, diabetes, or other problems. We know that microbiomes um, are potential homeostatic mechanisms in marine animals. So in this case, we're looking at a coral host. And we know that endolithic algae transfer photosynthate to the coral host, so that's transfer of sugar. Archaea can help in nitrogen cycling. Viruses transfer genes to their host, and these genes can be helpful um, homeostatic mechanisms. Bacteria help in nutrient cycling of sulfur, carbon, and nitrogen. And then fungi help produce in antimicrobial compounds and in nutrient cycling. So could the microbiome help maintain host pH homeostasis, and how will the microbiome change under a pH challenge? We know a little bit about the microbiome of Antipleura elegantissima. Work done by Ian Moreland and colleagues published in 2019 showed us that the taxonomic composition of brown anemones is more closely related or more closely similar to white anemones, and that green anemones are the odd ones out here. We're going to look uh, we're going to zoom in and look at the gastrovascular cavity microenvironment and the microbes that look uh, that live there. And this environment is likely important because of its uh, close proximity to these algal symbionts. So I was interested in three questions. First, just looking at is the functional profile of the GVC microbiome different than the exterior environment or seawater? How does it change with pH treatment and symbiotic state? And then look for specific genes that are changing under this reduced seawater pH condition. 
To answer these questions, I traveled to Boiler Bay and I collected 18 white and brown anemones. I conducted a home anemone COVID test by sticking a sterile swab in their gastrovascular cavity, twirling it for 30 seconds, taking that swab out and putting it in a DNA extraction tube and freezing it in liquid nitrogen. And this provided a baseline field microbiome sample for our anemones. I collected these anemones and brought them back to Hatfield Marine Science Center where they went, underwent a seven day acclimation period so they could get used to the light environment and the um, seawater conditions of our lab. And then they underwent a 20 day ocean acidification experiment. I had two um, treatments, pH 8.1 or ambient and pH 7.25 or low. And within each treatment, I had a sample size of three per symbiotic state. So three white, three brown. So these black circles represent a sample. And then within each sample, I had three anemones that I combined their microbiome samples before I sequenced them. I swabbed their anemone gastrovascular cavities at day zero and 20 to collect microbiome samples. I brought these microbiome samples back to Corvallis, extracted genomic DNA, and performed whole genome shotgun sequencing across two lanes on a high seq 3000. I prepped the data using HUMON3 which outputs three different tables, a gene families table, a pathway coverage and pathway abundance table. Today, I'll just be showing you information from the gene families table. I decontaminated these gene families based on sequencing of a sterile cotton swab and a blank DNA extraction kit. And then I analyzed alpha beta diversity and functional profiles using thylaceic and maslin too. So first we'll look at the uh, reduced seawater pH experiment. So we have day on the x-axis here and pH on the y. Uh, the blue line is our incoming untreated seawater. The yellow line is the ambient pH treatment and the red line is the low pH treatment. So as you can see, we su successfully acidified the seawater. And then there's two other things I'd like to point out. The sharp decline in pH around day three was caused by an equipment malfunction that let CO2 rush into our system uh, unregulated. And then this negative trend in pH over the course of our experiment, which is suggestive of an upwelling um, event that occurred during our experiment. So we'll first explore how the microbiome in the GBC is different than seawater. Before I show you those results, a quick primer on uh, microbiology uh, statistics, or microbiome statistics. Let's imagine we have two ponds, pond A and pond B, and we have different fish in these ponds denoted by uh, the different colors. So in pond A, we have blue species, red species, green species, and yellow species. And in pond B, we only have red and blue. We can calculate the richness and evenness of these two ponds. Richness is the number of different species. So in pond A, we have four different species. So we have a richness of four. And in pond B, we have a richness of two. Evenness or abundance is a measure of species distribution. So in pond A, we have about 50% blue, 20% yellow and green, and 10% red. While in pond B, we have 50% red and blue. So we would say that pond B has higher evenness. The, the species are more evenly distributed, though pond A has higher richness. From richness and evenness, we can calculate alpha and beta diversity. Alpha diversity is within sample diversity, so diversity within A, diversity within B, and we can compare alpha diversities between each other. Beta diversity is between sample diversity, and that's where we look at the community of A and the community of B and compare them. And then typically alpha and beta diversity are reported for taxonomic um, compositions, but today we'll be looking at functional diversity. So looking at those different gene families present. So in our anemone versus seawater functional alpha diversity, this is Chow 1 index, which is a measure, measure of richness. The brown dots are anemone samples, the blue dots are seawater samples. And you'll see that seawater has significantly higher Chow 1 compared with the anemone samples. I also measured Shannon's and Simpson's diversity, which incorporate both richness and evenness. And again, I found the same pattern um, with seawater having significantly higher alpha diversity compared to anemones. 
For beta diversity, this is a non-metric multidimensional scaling of Bray Curtis dissimilarity. And there are two axes here, axis one and axis two. And then you'll see little percentages behind each axis. And this is the amount of variance explained by that axis. So 74% of the variance is explained by moving right to left, while 11% is move, uh, explained by moving up and down. And you'll see clear distinction between um, the anemone uh, community and the seawater community. And we can measure that using a permanova. A permanova um, tells you if the centroids of these communities are significantly different than each other. And indeed, they are here. We can also look at the dispersion of the communities. So we use a perm disk to measure that. And you can see here, um, this between this point and this center is uh, very dispersed, while the distance between this point and this point is less dispersed. This suggests that the GVC is a microbial environment that is different than seawater. And based on this, I decontaminated my samples using seawater as a contaminant as well. So is there a functional difference between the GVC microbiome and seawater? Yes. Next, we'll compare pH treatments and symbiotic states. So first, the pH treatments. The brown dots are field microbiome samples. The blue dots are ambient pH samples. And the yellow dots are low pH samples. For Chow1, I detected no difference in alpha diversity. And the same for Shannon's and Simpson's. For symbiosis, these tan samples are aposymbiotic or white anemones and the brown samples are brown anemones or symbiotic anemones. And again, I detected no differences in alpha diversity uh, between or based on symbiosis. Next, we'll look at beta diversity, pH first. And again, the colors are the same. I did not find any difference in the communities between um, different pH treatments. This next graph I'll show you is a visualization of dispersion. So distance to the centroid is on the y-axis. So the further you are from the centroid, the more dispersed you are. I found no difference in dispersion uh, between these three pH treatments. For symbiosis, however, I did find the difference in the communities based on um, the area of their centroids. So uh, the center of this ellipse compared to the center of this ellipse. And this difference in communities based on symbiosis is not driven by dispersion. So this further supports the hypothesis that the gastrovascular cavity is a microbial environment that is different than seawater. And maybe that host or the microbes have mechanisms that help shield the GBC microenvironment from outside environmental factors. So is there a functional profile difference based on pH treatment? No but yes, by symbiotic state. Finally, how does reduced seawater pH affect the functional profile? So looking for specific genes that change when you're living in a reduced sea, seawater pH environment. I detected no differentially abundant gene pathways between pH treatment, symbiotic state, experiment day, or their interactions. And I didn't show you data for experiment day or their interactions in this presentation. In conclusion, there is a difference in functional profile compared to seawater. There's no difference based on pH treatment. There is a difference by symbiotic state. And again, data I didn't show you, there's no difference between the interaction uh, between pH treatment and symbiotic state. And then I didn't detect any genes that are different under this reduced seawater pH treatment. So this hypothesis that the GVC is a microenvironment that is regulated and protected from external pH changes is interesting because we do know that cnidarians exchange old gastrovascular water with fresh water, though it is unclear how much of the gastrovascular water is exchanged. So why is there this difference in the microbial functions between the two environments? Well, you might think about coral or cnidarian mucus here. So this is a picture uh, and you can see the mucus that is starting to drip off the coral here. If we recall our sea anemone cross section, Sea anemones produce mucus as well. And they have mucus on their outside, so I've highlighted in yellow, but they also have mucus within their gastrovascular cavity. We might imagine that or hypothesize that 
the mucus in the gastrovascular cavity might not be exchanged or shed as often as this outer mucus layer, and thus might host this specific gastrovascular cavity microbiome. Some next steps with this project include further analyzing the microbiome data that I have, so performing genome assembly on, on all of my microbiome samples, analyzing the pathway abundance and coverage information, those other two tables that are output from Juman, exploring the GVC microenvironment under stable state and different environmental conditions, so looking at different pH, um, oxygen, nutrients within the gastrovascular cavity, performing other omic techniques on the GVC microbiome, including transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics to further dive into what those microbes are doing. I also generated a list of 186 differentially abundant pathways between seawater and the GVC, and these are likely good starting points for further studies on this microbiome environment. So in this presentation, we've explored two different perspectives of this Cnidarian microbe symbiosis. In the microbiome and ocean acidification chapter, I showed you that the gastrovascular cavity is an environment that is different than seawater. And this underscores the need to characterize the microenvironment in Cnidarians. In the carbonic anhydrosis chapter, I showed, I provided additional insight into the trophic strategies of this temperate symbiotic Cnidarian, which is different than their tropical counterparts. Overall, this work has helped form a fuller understanding of the singular and synergistic interactions of this host and its microbial symbionts, and has helped work towards a holistic point of view that will be vital in predicting how climate change will affect this symbiosis and other relationships like it. Who knows, maybe Anthopleura will take over the world one day. Maybe not to this extent, but they are winners. I need to thank um, everyone who has helped make this journey successful. First and foremost, my advisor, Dr. Virginia Weiss, thank you for supporting me from day one, listening to my wild ideas and letting me carry out some of them. To my committee members, Francis, Becky, Felipe, and Michael, thank you for your input and advice on all of these chapters. Science is not a solo effort, and there are many people who have helped make this um, successful. So thank you to you all. A uh, special thanks to the Integrative Biology Office staff, Tara, Teresa, Tracy, and Trudy. Um, thank you for being there to answer all of our questions and um, for your smiling faces in the office. It's, it was always a pleasure to come down and uh, chat when needed. Thank you to my funding sources. To the Weiss Lab past and present, it's been a blast getting to know you all and been fun doing science with everyone. To all the friends that I've made during my time here, um, uh, you're all like family to me. Um, you're welcome anytime. To my family, um, my dad, my mom, my sister, thank you for reminding me every day to do my best. To my um, father's-in-law and my mother's-in-law, thank you for supporting me. To my dog, Boone, thank you for reminding me to read books lay down sometimes, and wear silly hats. And finally, to my wife, Morgan, thank you for standing with me on this journey and being um, a vital part of my support network. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, great, great presentation. Um, for, for those of you who may not know, under your reactions tab in Zoom, you can raise your hand. So if you have a question for Jack, um, go ahead and raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, for those who are on the committee, please don't ask questions now. Of course, we'll, we'll, um, we'll have you ask questions in the private uh, part of the exam later. So I see a question from Jeff Chang. Hey Jack, I have one comment and two questions. My first comment is beautiful talk. I think it just raised the bar, that was spectacular. You did not disappoint whatsoever. 
I have two questions. The first one is, when you do the COVID-19 testing, what is their gag reflex like? Uh, it's the worst. I mean, yeah, I thought so. Like, yeah, they don't like it at all. <laughs> the second question is with your sampling. <clears throat> so for the, for the carbonic at, uh, and hydro, hydrase, you told us that they occupy different colonies and they're clonal. Now you had N equals 10. Were you sampling between colonies or was it within colonies? So you're looking at one particular genotype. Um, that's a great question. So it is very difficult to find brown, green, and white anemones that appear to be a single genotype. Um, you usually have to look in different areas. So the data from that chapter is, I, I would guess that those are all different genotypes. The, the size experiment were from a single genotype for sure. Like we, we picked a colony and selected all our animals from there. But are you asking Jeff about, for example, the browns? Or I was just trying to, you know, trying to understand what the variation is coming from. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay. All right, oh, that's, that's, yeah. So within a symbiotic state, so all the brown anemones from that um, experiment were from, a, from the same colony. All the white anemones were from the same colony. All the green anemones were from the same colony. The variation, I imagine, I, I hypothesize is from size, actually. We, I, we didn't account for size when we were collecting those anemones because we had no idea that size um, would have such a big effect on carbonic anhydrase activity. So I, I, I think that the variation within the symbiotic state is driven by size. Excellent. Thank you. Again, great job. Thanks. Okay, um, other questions. I. I absolutely insisted to Jack that we spend no more than an hour um, in the public part of the exam. So we have a little bit more time. Um, don't be shy. Okay, uh, Raul raised his hand. Go ahead and go ahead, Raul. Uh, thanks, Virginia. Great job, Jack. The presentation was awesome. I really like your, your whole research. It's a very silly question, actually. I was just wondering, um, because you show that the ga uh, gastrovascular cavity is, is a very different environment from the seawater or the environmental water. Uh, did you see that it is actually slimy or like, because you hypothesize that it's probably like some mucus or something, right? Do you, did you see that during the sampling? Uh, yeah, you can definitely tell that there is some mucus on the cotton swab um, after you've sampled it. I think it'd be interesting to swab the outside of the anemone and then also swab the inside of the anemone and compare the microbiomes between those two as well. That would um, maybe support things a little better. Okay, Brian, you have a question. Yeah, hey Jack, uh, that was really great job. Um, I guess I'm just wondering what was your favorite part of this project? And um, traveling to Washington and hanging out at the Marine Lab for um, I, over a couple, I guess it was like two months. Um, you know, it was right on, you could see the horizon, so you get to watch sunset. Um, the hardest part, I'll just go ahead and tell you that, was the bioinformatics of everything. My, my head doesn't quite wrap around that as nicely as uh, carbonic anhydrase assays. But definitely the, the carbonic and hydrates work. My, yeah, my favorite. Driving a boat around, let's do it. <laughs> Others, <clears throat> other questions? Um, there's a question, yeah, in the chat. Um, I'll just read it out loud. So Sandra asked, how do you how did you keep the sea anemone symbiont free in the ocean flow through system? Filtering, we seem to keep picking up algae all the time. Again, excellent work. Yeah, um, I don't think, I didn't worry about keeping the anemone symbiont free in that flow through experiment. Um, they were all under the same light environment because light could also be driving differences in, in the microbiome or if you're looking at carbonic anhydrase, could have driven that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I just didn't worry about it. They didn't brown up fast enough to really 
see anything. And I don't, maybe I need to go back and look at those anemones and see quantify algae in those white anemones to see if it it's substantial. Yeah. But I mean, it's, in the literature, it's clear that Anthopleura is, maybe it's the temperate system, maybe not, but it's a completely different beast when it comes to browning up. So it's, for example, Sandra, it's nothing like Aptasia. Aptasia, if you say light to it, it browns up. So it's a completely different system. And Barb has a question, Jack. Barb's question, um, does the anemone control the pH of the cavity? Is it possible ah. that they're able to accommodate for the pH differences? Yeah, so I have some um, preliminary data and um, there's some work by Colleen Bove. Um, I, I, I didn't put the, put the graph in my, in my presentation, I'm sorry, but there are differences in gastrovascular pH throughout the day. And it appears that they're driven by the symbionts, not by the anemone. But right now my sample size is one for each of the symbiotic states. So um, we need more research there. My, my, my pH probe broke and then they discontinued it. So, I, so yes, um, for your second question, is it possible that they accommodate for these pH changes? Yeah, it's absolutely possible because they see um, pretty big swings in pH in the brown anemones. Okay, there are a couple more questions in the chat and maybe after those two, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, Hannah, do you think your carbonic anhydrase activity size result will hold up with the symbiotic algae? Interesting. Um, I'm not sure. That would go back to whether or how controlled the symbiotic environment is like in the gastrovascular cells, um, do those symbionts in those large anemones, do they just have plenty of CO2 anyways? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Alex, another question about the flow through experiment. Was there separation between individual organisms or were they all grouped by seawater treatment together in tanks? Um, are my samples, each sample size, or each, each sample was in a three liter plastic aquarium. And within that aquarium, there were just three anemones that were not separated from each other. But between those samples, those were separated from each other. They all had their own incoming seawater and that seawater never mixed with another sample. Okay, last question from Luca. Um, curiosity on the carbonic anhydrase activity results. Can the unexpected trend between small and big individuals be explained by different activities of them? Smalls having to fight and bog down to reproduce. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, possibly. I'm not sure how much those um, soldier and enemies are, are, or how often they're going out and fighting neighboring colonies. We know that they do go out and fight um, but potentially, I think we tried to think about how metabolic rate might have affected carbonic anhydrase activity as well there. Um, I, don't, I don't recall what, what we came up with with metabolic rate, but doing some metabolic rate study and correlating that with size might, might help answer that question. Okay, great. Um, great questions. Jack, you did a, a really a fine job with this, with your uh, defense, your, oral, your the public part of your defense. Um, for those of us on the committee now, we're gonna adjourn and go to a different Zoom room that I sent you a link for. Uh, please, let's reconvene at um, 3.10 on that Zoom link. But uh, the rest of us, we can, say congratulations and good job again to Jack. Um, and we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be in touch with all later uh, about for a Zoom celebration. Thank so you thanks everyone. All. Thanks for coming. Virginia, you sent it when? I don't see it. I sent it in, e 